Okay. So now Let's there's a, a there's a case for yeah there's a case where somebody the judgment was for eighty thousand dollars and some of our questions have been you know what what really is the the minimum you know amount of assets that you need to have in order to establish protection. Um, you know, what for an eighty thousand dollar judgment? No, for for someone who someone who doesn't have an asset protection plan in place, they may think, well, I'm I'm not worth ten million dollars. I don't need asset protection. I'm not worth, you know, two million dollars. I don't need asset protection. Could e either one of you, you know, address that? Yes, I can. Uh, Rob, I know you can speak to that, but I would like to speak to that too. This is Boyd. Um, a lot of my clients earn a living and they make fifty grand a year, maybe a hundred to three hundred grand a year. They make a good living, and you're right. They're not Donald Trump lotto rich, uh, and they and they may never be. But what they do have are homes with equity. And if you don't implement asset protection, asset protection isn't just for the rich. It's for everybody, and it's not expensive. For instance, um, if if the person asks in the question, let's just assume that, that they're not married, they're single, and they have a home uh, or a condo, anything that they're paying for, a car, whatever. If a judgment gets taken against you for $80,000, they can put a lien on your home. You're going to get a lien placed against your home. They can also, in Georgia and in Alabama, go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and put a lien on your car. So whenever you try to refi or sell your home, or trade your car in, that lien is going to be there. And you can't sell it or transfer it until that lien is satisfied. Now the creditor is in the driver's seat for $80,000. You could have, A, put your home into a family limited liability company or a family limited liability partnership or a corporation. And if the judgment gets entered against you, it's not going to encumber your asset. And while they may not be able to foreclose on the asset because there's a mortgage, you've got equity. And that lien is going to eat up the equity in your property. And if you try to sell, or let's say you get a job and you've got to move for your business, you now can't sell your house because you've got to come out of pocket 80 grand, maybe 40 grand. To, 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 to cover the loss you're going to sustain to get that, that judgment lien off your house. So while you may not think you need asset protection, everybody needs it at some level or extent. And it's just a matter of thinking through the possibility of what might happen. We don't deal in probability. Probability gets you nowhere. It's the possibility. Could it happen? Yes. Then if you want to be conservative, do X. If you're really liberal and a risk taker, do Y. And it's, it's, asset protection is a, is a balancing of risks and expenses. And guys, it's, some not people, just, it's not just a plan. It's not just some offshore trust and an offshore this. Asset protection for you, using the homestead exemption, which is not an expensive thing to do. It could be hiring Boyd to review your corporate setup, which... Boyd, what would that cost? A a small hardware. A man owns a a, a, a the local the local Ace Hardware store. He's uh, got a million. If your if your corporation has been in business for less than ten years and there's one maybe two shareholders and there's never been major changes, it's just we we bill it hourly. So two seventy five an hour. I look at your book. I mean, it's not it's not a lot of money. You know, if but if you've got a business that's been in business for thirty years and it's blank, I got a lot of work, and I got to get everything brought up to speed. And it's not just you telling me I got to have your tax returns and everything else. I got to make sure your your books reflect what you've done. You can update your records and you can complete your records. I've got clients that have had offices get burned, flooded, and we've had to go back and recreate records. And not and not in a bad manner. Just they they were destroyed through through loss of 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 either fire or water damage. You know, yet you have to if you didn't have them backed up on a computer or didn't have a copy kept safe somewhere. I mean, everything I do is backed up on a on a server 
And a lot of times they'll say, hey, we just had a water loss or a fire. You know, can I need to figure out what companies I've got. I don't even know. Can I come sit down with you? And we start ordering record books again and rebuilding and putting everything back together. So it's not, it's not hard to do. We do that all the time. Um, so it's not a lot of money. Um, it gets more expensive the more shareholders you have and, and the longer you've been in business and the more stuff you bring to look at, it certainly starts to, to, to cost more. But an initial review, you know, you, you get a book and you look at it, it's usually not that long and not that hard to look at for, for, for what you're talking about, Rob. Two or three grand at the most for a regular company. Guys, that's, that's, asset protection is not for the rich only. It is a rite of passage. Every single human being with a family has an obligation to his family, in my mind, to do their best to protect their kids, their husband or spouse. And truly, guys, you just got to do it. You just, you just got to make the make the space in your life and in your pocketbook to take care. And 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 notice, we're not trying to sell. We're just just talking about the way it really works. More questions. There's a, there's a lot more questions. I Rob, know people are going to start going, but can we do like ten more minutes? Rob, I'm because we are sure. so late. I just wanted to um, say if if anybody has questions about if, if they want to uh, find out more about setting up asset protection, can we uh, have them email us at support or something? Support at asset protection training, and it'll be passed on to Boyd, and we'll make them work. Okay, so I'm going to put that into the chat to everyone. Support at assetprotectiontraining.com. If you have questions, you want to find out more about setting up asset protection, uh, just send us an email. Uh, at that address or this in the chat. Now I'm going to get to one of the other questions. Um, can retirement funds, are they able to be garnished? In Georgia, no. Um, IRAs are exempt. However, once they are paid out and land in your personal bank account, then yes. Okay, if you it, have an IRA or some type of retirement account, it's exempt while it's there, but once it's paid to you and it's in your possession and in your bank account, then yes, they can get it. And also, guys, in most states, almost as a general rule, ERISA is nearly 100%. I mean, it is 100%. That's what kept OJ in the pink, even though he murdered two people and is just a complete and total crook. Um, but that's how he got to keep his money because of his NFL ERISA qualified plan. IRAs are different. In a, in a significant number of the states, IRAs can be reached, but it's next to impossible to reach them. And they're protected in bankruptcy unless the bankruptcy judge finds you're so rich that the IRA is just extraneous. So IRAs are pretty safe but not 100%. ERISA is 100%. About filing bankruptcy, does that arrest or prevent garnishments? Boyd? That's from, that's from James Burns, but, one of the best asset protection guys I know. Thank you for attending, James. Um, bankruptcy will stop immediately any state court or federal court proceeding in, in a district court or, a, or or any type of trial court at the state level. It will stop. The 362 stay will stop all collection efforts. It will stop litigation, and if it's, if it's post-judgment, it will stop all litigation. And <clears throat> understand that it may stop it temporarily because if you have engaged in an act under Section 523 of the Bankruptcy Code, it lists a number of activities, types of debts and liabilities that you could incur leading up to the bankruptcy that are non-dischargeable. So if someone's gotten a judgment against you for breach of contract or negligence, something like that, if you file bankruptcy and the amount of the liability exceeds your assets, it's going to stop it. You're going to go through the bankruptcy court, generally speaking, and you're going to get discharged. If you embezzled money, engaged in fraud, or any type of, of act that involves dishonesty and intentional harm, 
the bankruptcy court is not going to discharge that debt. They're not going to discharge back taxes. They're not going to discharge anything involving criminal restitution, and they're not going to discharge anything involving the intentional torts, like assault, battery, fraud, that kind of stuff. But if it's breach of contract or negligence, the bankruptcy is going to stop it, and generally speaking, uh, it will go now. Depending on the nature and extent of your assets and your jurisdiction, uh, and this varies widely uh, across the U.S., um, the bankruptcy may be worse than, than the creditor taking one or two of your assets if you get an aggressive trustee. But generally speaking, if the question is, will the filing of bankruptcy stop a garnishment, the answer is yes, temporarily. It may stop it permanently, um, or it may stop it temporarily. Great. Thank you, Boyd. Somebody asked a question about uh, how to avoid gift tax when transferring assets to a self-settled trust. Okay, let me do that one. Okay. Um, a self-settled trust, by the way, domestic self-settled trusts don't work, and now they don't work even more than they didn't work six weeks ago because there's starting to be reported cases showing them failing. But um, when you transfer assets to a self-settled trust, which is what almost all asset protection trusts are, the defective grantor trusts are not my something I favor. Uh, when you transfer assets to a, a, to a grantor trust, there is no gift tax. The reason is because the set law retains the power to change beneficiaries at any time, so it's treated as a gift to yourself. In fact, an asset protection trust is normally disregarded for tax purposes. So the tax issues are not important. Asset protection planning done properly will neither increase nor decrease your tax liability, but it will preserve your capacity to plan. You can do any planning you would do as an individual with the plan in place. Good enough? That's great. Thanks. Another question was, uh, one of our listeners has a lot of cash accounts that are associated with their Social Security number, and they want to protect it for retirement. Uh, is an LLC in another state a good way to hold this cash? Boy. Um, it depends on who you're trying to protect from. I think Rob can answer this. Um, I, I never, number one, I, I never like seeing clients hold. And I don't know if the question was the question that they had multiple accounts at the same bank or just multiple accounts at different banks. Uh, I believe it's multiple banks because the question came. I have lots of cash accounts associated with my social security number, and they want to protect it for retirement. Yeah. Um, it's. If you want to protect that from retirement, the, the easiest thing to do, uh, and, I, and I think it's, it's kind of like what you've got, Rob, depending on how much money, I would diversify it. I would take the bulk of it, and, and I would get it into some type of asset protection trust. I would get it out of your name. Uh, for ease, I would keep some of it available, um, but I would try to consolidate as much of it as, as you possibly could. I would, I would treat the asset protection trust as your, as your savings account somewhere to put it so that you can get it when you need it, uh, and then I would, I would keep some available so that you can use it, you know, conveniently, uh, and I would have some domestically, and, and then I would try to play some internationally. Rob, I don't know if you've got anything on that, but I can tell you through one of my clients, he loved Bank X, and he had 57 companies, and he had probably about 92 bank accounts at this one bank with his social security number. Well, when he had a development go down, the creditor, okay, had his financial statement. And when they got taken over by the FTC and the new aggressive creditor came in and got it, they had a roadmap to everything he had. And I was never made privy to where he banked. And so having multiple accounts tied to your name gave them a roadmap to all of his companies. And that we're still dealing with the fallout of that. And uh, now is the time to start moving and consolidating those accounts. So absolutely, if, if you're wanting to, if you're, if you're retired and you're not engaged in anything, you've got insurance and you've, you've got some of that front-end asset protection on, um, you know, you, you've probably got a couple of options. But I, I agree, I would not have multiple accounts uh, targeted all over with my, with my name. I would, I would try to... Uh, I would keep it diversified a little bit. I would not put all my eggs in one basket, but I don't know how many accounts you have. But generally speaking, my clients have multiple cash accounts with their names on it. 
if a judgment comes through, have a lot of problems. So I think it's better to, to, to get it out of your name and into an LLC, at least get it into an LLC or something else that'll 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 get it out of your name. But yeah. Yeah, but absolutely. that's only a, that's only a start. Boy, and that's, that's a, a start, good start. Exactly. My my feeling is there's two rules of asset protection. If you have more cash than you need, you want to trigger both both rules. First rule is what you don't own cannot be taken from you. That's what a trust does. It gets it off your balance sheet so you don't own it. Second rule is no country in the world automatically enforces U.S. judgments. If you've got a bunch of cash in 22 bank accounts throughout the United States, look, there's a full faith and credit clause in the U.S. Every state recognizes everybody else's judgments. If you move your money out of the United States and have triggered the first rule, which is what you don't own cannot be taken from you, your money's virtually is 100% safe unless the bank you put it into goes under. So candidly, the United States is just not a good place to hoard cash in my mind. But I'm jaded and very dissatisfied with the stability of the United States. It's a level of comfort. You know, some people freak out about expatriating cash or, or assets, and uh, you know their fears are justified to 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 some level or extent, uh, but depending see, on where they want to park that I, cash. I, I I I freak out by not expatriating it. I think people who don't are really oh, yeah. unwise. So you really, it's really kind of a wide open arrangement. I mean, a wide open debate here. It is. Well, they they fear. What if what if you know, we get into a situation and the power goes down, and and I can't access my money, and it's in another country. What if the what if they what if it goes over there and they get hit by a tsunami or an earthquake, and now I can't get my money? Well, you know, it's temporary. I doubt it'll be permanent, but but they do have some concerns about that. But it doesn't matter if you banked in a bank that only existed in California and you live in Washington, um, D.C. Uh, if something happened over there and the only branch was in California and you couldn't you know, affect the wire, you're going to have the same problem here. Um, but right. generally speaking, you, you don't want to keep it. And you have a number of options, but certainly getting it, if you're, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of protecting it from a creditor, they do need to be consolidated somewhat and taken out of your name, and those accounts do not need to be associated with your Social Security number. Great. So along great, the lines great. of... Talk about Hold on, hold on, Tony. One thing: social security number is a big deal. As Boyd will tell you, when he hires one of his fancy ex-FBI agents, they say, "Do you have the guy's social security number?" If Boyd does have the guy's social security number, which is discoverable, guys, so he discovers it, he gets your tax returns, he's got your social. If you give it, if you give an investigator a person's social, and they're willing to be aggressive with their investigation, which they will be if you pay them enough. They're going to find out every single thing that's available, other than the stuff the NSA owns about knows about your, you know, who who you've been seeing at night and stuff. It's basically there is nothing hidden anymore. There is no such thing as a secret bank account, and there is no such thing as a hidden um, hidden bank account anywhere in the United States. Period. Next question. Along the lines of uh, not owning anything, taking things out of out of your name, one of the questions was: If you don't own anything and you're only a manager of a Belize LLC, can the court system still throw you in jail to compel compliance? Yes. That's why you avoid fraudulent conveyancing. You do not do a plan if there's any probability that you're going to look like you're engaging in a fraudulent conveyance. That's why if you've already got a lawsuit pending, you make sure you've reserved sufficient assets to more than meet your reasonably anticipated debts. If you do that, you can go hog wild and protect the rest of your assets, and you have a duty to your family and yourself to do so. My, my position anyway. Boyd? Um. I took the question a different way, and I, I felt that to be that if a judgment is taken against you, and if you are the manager of a Belizean LLC that's owned by the Asset Protection Trust, can the court compel you to repatriate assets? 
state courts, I, I, I've not seen one do it yet, and I don't know if you have, Rob, but my general consensus would be no. Uh, and, and the reason no, for that no, is, no. yeah, no, they're, no, they're not. Now, you may have to, but the point of having a strong asset protection plan, and in that specific example with the Belizean LLC and the Belizean Asset Protection Trust, um, at the end of the day, if the creditor gets you and says, where's all your stuff, and you go, well, I'm the manager of this LLC, it's in Belize, and i got this trust, and everything's down there, well, if they want it, they can go down there and get it. But wait a minute. If they had a default judgment against you, they can't domesticate in Belize anyway. And if they got a judgment against you on a motion, a substantive motion like summary judgment, or got a jury verdict against you, or, or, or a verdict against you from bench trial where the judge was the jury as well as the judge, then they can domesticate it. But as Rob will tell you, the filing fee is non-refundable, and it's 50 grand or 50% of the value of the judgment. And then if and when they domesticate the judgment and Belize and get down there, your asset protection trust is immune. So when you're looking at a domestic court like in Georgia or Alabama, a judge is not going to tell you, you have to pay these people. He may tell you, you have to answer their questions, and you have to produce bank records, and you have to produce tax returns. But he's not going to tell you, you have to pay them. We don't have debtor's prison. They, they, the law says we can garnish, levy, or foreclose in this state. So if they can't garnish, levy, or foreclose, and you don't have assets in the jurisdiction of the court, the judge is not going to make you bring assets to the jurisdiction of the court so that they can garnish, levy, or foreclose. Now they know where your assets are. Go get them. Try. And most creditors are not going to. But just remember back early on, the only exception to that rule is going to be the federal government and any agency of the federal government. They'll get whatever they want. So the answer is in, with private creditors in a state court or even in a federal court where it's a private creditor, I doubt very seriously you're going to ever encounter a scenario unless a statute is passed because the court doesn't have the power to force you to do that. There are some limited exceptions. If you're in a divorce and you get cute and you take a bunch of money and you shove it down in your asset protection trust in Belize, a superior court judge in Georgia or a circuit court judge in Alabama, if your spouse knows about it, they can make you disgorge that money and bring it back. And if you don't, they'll put you in jail for contempt. Not because you, you know, they're going to put you in jail. So there are some limited instances where that could happen. Divorce is, is one area where your asset would be the second area, I would say, asset protection planning has some loopholes. And what may apply to a third-party creditor, private creditor, may not, apply to, may not apply to a spouse. The rules are different in divorce. Would you agree, Rob? Oh, absolutely, completely. But, but given two or three years lead time, somebody who's in control of the pocketbook can certainly disenfranchise his or her spouse doing a properly done asset protection plan. And that's why if your money's joint, make sure you know what it, where it is and what's going on with it. Yeah. I hate those calls. I take the clients, but I hate those calls. And don't yep. be one of those don't be one of those victims of Rob Lambert's meanness. <laughs> so so right, gentlemen next question. We're coming up on the, you know a two hour mark here so uh, I just want to let everyone know if you have questions about anything that didn't get answered during this webinar or something else comes up for you or you want information about what you might need to do to protect yourself please just send an email uh, to uh, us at support at assetprotectiontraining.com we'll put that email there in the chat screen you should be able to see it on your screen we're not going to get to everybody's questions. I think we'll wrap this up at, uh, in, in about six minutes. So I just want to let you know uh, we won't leave you hanging. If you have questions, just send them to us via email. Um, Thanks, Tony. Sure.
uh, one of the questions that we, that came in from Jason was, is it possible to pierce the tidal veil, um, such as in the use of an asset that was not in your name but clearly was generated or created by you? I've, I, and, and Rob, you can comment on that. I've never heard of that, and I can tell you that, that in Georgia, if it was, if you, if, if, if I bought a car for somebody or a house, but it wasn't titled in my name, I don't, I don't own it. And if I did that as a gift or, or some act of detached or kind generosity or, or some other, um, you know, if I gave some, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think. So. If you buy something but it's not titled in your name, I mean, you don't own it. So a creditor would, would have a hard time in Georgia uh, doing that. Uh, Georgia does not recognize reverse veil piercing. For instance, if you have two companies and you're an officer and director of company A and they pierce the veil from company A and get you liable for a debt, they can't reverse veil pierce and get the assets of, of company B. Georgia doesn't allow reverse veil piercing in the corporate context. So if, if looking at that, that's the closest thing I can think of in my mind that would come to, 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 to piercing a title veil. Um, I have never seen um, a case or a statute in Georgia or Alabama that would allow someone to do that if it wasn't a fraudulent conveyance. If you pay fair market value for 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 some type of, of personality or realty, but it gets titled in someone else's name, that's not illegal. People people do that. You can do that as long as there's a what is the reason behind it? What was the consideration for it? Um, if it's a sham transaction or a straw purchase, it might be able to be set aside for fraud. But if you were giving something to somebody, I mean, you're talking about a gift. So if you if you acquired an asset that you paid for, but it wasn't titled in your name, I don't necessarily think that would automatically give a creditor the right, but under certain circumstances, I think they may try to set the transaction aside. If, if they argue successfully that it was a straw purchase or, or fraud. Rob? Um, I, I, I've seen it happen. Um, an asset that's not in your name but was purchased by you, generated by you. Um, I have seen people spend large amounts of money to benefit their friends and lovers and think that by making substantial gifts, essentially, um, that money was out of their hands and not no longer available to usually their children to go after. Well, in those cases, um, I've, I have actually seen courts impose constructive trusts. Look, if it's not, if it's if it's yours and you own, a, you owe a lot of money. Giving it away just makes the person you give it to become your co-conspirator. Just like like Boyd said, don't get your 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 wife, her sister, her mother, your family involved with trying to do gifts to families and make, you know, if you if you've got problems. Take them head on, but don't involve the rest of the family. And the gifts usually, if you do or you buy things and you use them, they can cause terrible problems, terrible, terrible emotional and family issues. You know, the legal stuff becomes small time compared to the emotional stuff when they're destroying people. But again, I mean, I don't, Rob, I don't think there's any law that says you can't Spend your money however you want to, and it, 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 there's a restriction on what you can or can't buy. I mean, no, you you can spend it any way you want if it's yeah. your money. Only if it's your money. If it's your money, you're holding in a constructive trust for your creditors. Then you can expect your creditors to go after you if you spend twenty five million dollars buying a seventy five foot yacht. But I think it's all in context. I think if you bought, you know, if your brother was down on his luck. And you bought him a ninety-five thousand dollar house and a ten thousand dollar pickup truck to get him back on his feet. If some creditor tried to come in and bust that, there are assets there that you purchased, but they're not titled in your name. They're not. They're not your assets. And I think no. in in that scenario, they're going to have a hard time doing it. Um, if you're married and you've got you know and you're and you're and you're sixty years old and your wife's fifty and you've got a twenty-two year old 
uh, playmate girlfriend living down in South Beach, and you buy a $3 million condo and put her in there when your company's facing all kinds of suits and charges for, for illicit activities, yeah, they're going to probably go after that. And that, that may not be a legitimate use of your, of your money and, and sheltering of a potential asset. But the problem is, if you do that, you have to be real careful. Who are you giving it to and why? My brother, anything I give him, I, I, you know, my brother tells me I loan him money. Well, I really haven't. I've really just given it to him because I don't expect to get it back. You know, families can, can be that way sometimes. But I've given my brother a lot of stuff, but I did it because I never expected to get it back. I, I truly legitimately gave it to him as a detached act of love and generosity. And in those transactions, the assets that are derived from my, beha from my behavior, I would challenge anyone to set aside, not me personally, but anybody doing something in that, in that manner or method. But certainly people do that as a way to hide or shelter assets. But again, you're now getting into the straw purchase or the, uh, or the fraudulent conveyance. And that's where that starts to stink. Right, right. No, no, we're on the same boat. Yeah. Okay, so I have one last question. I think that it's uh, pretty in-depth. About 10 years ago, uh, one of our listeners formed um, an LLC with a member manager setup using IRS Form 1065. He and his wife are the only members. Uh, he is a manager. They both have 50% equity, um, owning 50 units of the 100-unit capitalization. His corporate books show that there are original contributions and percentages and interest in the LLC. But when you mentioned that if you don't issue stock, you don't have a corporation, this concerned him because he says that he knows the IRS does not consider an LLC a legal entity, even though his state does and treats it for tax purposes just like a C or an S corp. Right. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So keep in mind, I'm in Georgia. I'm licensed in Georgia and Alabama. So my clients and my world is pretty much limited to two states out of 50. Limited liability companies in Georgia do not typically issue stock. They can. And the beauty of the LLC under Georgia's Limited Liability Company Act allows the company to choose its internal structure. It can be member managed. It can be manager managed. It can be co-manager managed. It can have an all-powerful manager separate from its members. Or it can be organized like a corporation. And it can have a board of directors. And it can have officers. And when they organize in Georgia, you have to have something that shows your ownership interest in the LLC. And typically, there are subscription agreements for units. It's not stock, just membership units. And if the company issues 1,000 units, and one member has 500 units, and the other member has 500 units, they're 50-50. But it's the way that it's set up that you see that it's in there. It's formed properly. So Georgia's Limited Liability Company Act specifies what you do when you organize and form an LLC. It may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And if you're in a state and you're not sure, there is a Limited Liability Company Act, and there's the Model Business Corporate Code, uh, and these are things like the Uniform Commercial Code and a lot of other stuff that are model codes that are adopted by, by a lot of the states. And if you're not sure, then just go see the attorney in your jurisdiction or whoever you, you want to consult with, and they can easily pull up the code for your state and tell you what should be in your book if you fully formed and organized. And if it's been that way forever, it's not hard to clean up and, and, and make sure that your corporate record book is proper. Attorneys look at that all the time. Books get damaged. Books get lost. Just because you lose a corporate record book doesn't mean that your company is destroyed or gone. You know, and if you didn't do it right, you can always have an attorney look at it, and it can be fixed. And the time to fix it is before a claim arises. So you don't want somebody saying, oh, well, you're playing funny with the books, because that's always uh, a, another risk that you've got, too. Um, so you want to make sure that you review your corporate records and make sure that they're in order. But probably from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, There'll be some variations or, or things that will differ slightly.
slightly from state to state about what should be in your book. Um, I mentioned corporations because specifically they do have stock, but LLCs typically do not. In Georgia, they have membership units, which is like this, which is like stock, um, but you don't have shareholders; you have members. But they're very similar. You just have a different a different business entity that has a different tax scheme that's that's separate from a C corp or an S corp and different rules. So it may not be a bad thing. And if and if you've got something in your organizational documents that outlines and identifies the equity ownership of the members, it should be sufficient. But you've got to go uh, and check your state's Limited Liability Company Act and, and make sure that if there are formational requirements that go beyond just filing articles of organization with your state's Secretary of State, that you've got that in there as well. And any transactional or corporate lawyer in your state will be able to help you do that. So don't panic. It may not, it may not be an issue. That's great. Thank you, Boyd. There, and you know, in regards to that, maybe you could just kind of summarize by clarifying. Earlier you mentioned about starting a brand new company, brand new business after a judgment's already in place. Uh, and the question that came in was, could they just take all of your stock in the new company along with garnishments or garnishments of wages or distributions? Well, the answer is it depends. Remember in my example, the short-sighted plaintiff's attorney in the other state, you're talking about an architect rendering professional services. I'm an attorney rendering professional services. If I screw up my client's case and I get sued for malpractice, do you think they're just going to sue Bush, Reed, and Jones? Or do you think M. Boyd Jones is going to be named on there as well? If you've got a good plaintiff's attorney, they're going to hit me and my company. Remember, any time that there's personal liability, it's far more difficult to do that. So. What you've got to do is be very careful. You've got to look. Remember, when the suit was filed against the architect, it was only against the company. And the reason for that was they sued for breach of contract. The contract was between the, the, the general contract or the owner and the architectural company, a, corpor a professional corporation, what we call a PC in Georgia. Um, so they didn't name him individually, so it was only against a business entity. So they're, they're limited to looking toward the business assets of the architectural firm to satisfy the judgment. If there's a judgment against you personally, personally, if you go, it's more difficult. It is very difficult at that point to, to establish a new entity and move forward. If you are in a state that allows a judgment creditor to levy and to take your ownership interest in a company, to take your stock in a corporation, or to seize and levy upon and take your membership interest in an LLC, then yeah, you can have a problem. Yes, they can, they can, they can garnish your individual bank account. They can seize your ownership interest in the company, potentially. Uh, and, 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 and more importantly, they can get a charging order so that as the owner or a member of an LLC or the shareholder in a corporation, if you were to receive a distribution, the charging order will require the corporation to pay the distribution that you would have recognized to the judgment creditor until they're paid in full. So you won't get a distribution until then. Now, certain states, in, in a, and I'm going off my memory here, but there's only three, Wyoming, Nevada, and Delaware, are the only states in the United States that do not allow and I'm pretty sure about this, that do not allow a creditor to seize your stock or your membership interest in a, in a corporation or a limited liability company. They will allow a creditor to get a charging order. So you can have money in a corporation or an LLC subsequent to a judgment in Delaware, Wyoming, or Nevada that accumulates wealth and money. But if the creditor finds out about it, they can certainly garnish that entity and say, if you owe Bill Smith money or Jane Doe money, it comes to us. So yes, the new company could be garnished. But again, you know, we talked about running deep, running silent. If you're organized and follow the law and start up new businesses and your electronic footprint is minimal, you may avoid it. There's, there's no way to do anything that's 100% because at some point, an aggressive creditor and a good attorney may find you 
or may find or discover the new assets or new entities, and they may try to take it. Right. Okay. But so we're got a judgment against you that you, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Boyd. Um, we are at the end of time, but what you just said kind of relates to two other questions. So maybe we can wrap it up with this one. What is charging order? And if you have an LLC in, say, Wyoming, but you're operating in California, which state law applies? In those situations, Georgia would apply Wyoming law because it's a foreign. It's a you would have to if you're gonna if you're gonna have a Wyoming LLC in California, you're gonna form in Wyoming, and it's gonna be a Wyoming LLC, but it may have a principal place of business in California, which is fine. California may allow that, but because it's a foreign entity, it's not a California entity, it's not going to be subject to California law. Same in Georgia. A Georgia court can't force a Delaware company to give its stock or membership unit to a Georgia creditor because Delaware says you can't do that. What was the follow-up to that? What are charging orders? Typically the state where the – yeah, typically where the state – Typically, where the, the business entity is organized is going to control what can or can't be taken. So they're going to look at the Wyoming Limited Liability Company Act. So if they tried to garnish that in California you know, or, or tried to levy upon that ownership interest in California, the attorney defending the claim would say, hey, it's a Wyoming company. The Wyoming Limited Liability Company Act forbids this. This company is not subject to this action in California, no. And, and that should take care of it. But again, if you're not sure and you're in California, touch base with, with your California counsel, and he should confirm that. And then the charging order is an order that someone would get from a state that would be served on a company. And a charging order charges the company with the duty to make payments for distributions to shareholders or members that have judgments against them to the creditors. And so. Someone can go to court and say, Bill Smith owns 25% interest in ABC Inc. or 123 LLC. We know that the company is generating a profit, and we're asking this court, here's the judgment we got on this date for these activities, and we're asking this court for an order charging the company to issue any payments for distributions or profits to this shareholder, to this creditor. And then the court will look at that and enter an order that says, you know, ABC Inc. or 123 LLC, you're hereby ordered that any distributions or profits that are recognized and distributed quarterly, biannually, or annually to your members, managers, and shareholders are to be paid to the creditor of so-and-so up to the extent of his ownership interest in the company. So ordered the blank day of blank. And they'll have language in there that'll say, you know, until the judgment's paid in full or whatever. So it's just, it's just a simple order that directs the company to pay the creditor the money that you should have received as a shareholder or a member as a distribution or dividend. Great. Thank you. Well, Boyd, Rob, thank you so much for your time. You guys have been extremely generous with your information and your time. And for those of you that are still listening, we have over 40 of you that have hung on with us for two hours. So you are champions. And up on the screen right now, oh, if, yeah. you, <laughs> if you... Um, champions or gluttons for punishment? One of the two. <laughs> if, if anyone on you know, line now, if you feel like you might need some assistance from Boyd, his information has been up on the screen, and, um, you know, please reach out to him. Again, if you have any other questions, you want more information about uh, setting up asset protection, please send an email to support at assetprotectiontraining.com, and we will get back to you just as quickly as we can. And watch your email, because we've got another webinar coming up next month with more killer information and we would love for you to join us and invite some friends. So Rob Boyd, uh, any final words before we uh, close this thing out today? Thank you. No, thank you all for, for being patient and I hope that um, what we talked about today can, can get you some, some practical guidelines and get you on the track to implement asset protection plans to protect you and your families. Fantastic. And for any of you that joined late, we will have a recording of this webinar available. Uh, it may be a day or two before we get that done, but we'll send out a replay link. And we thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to having you again with us uh, the next time. So God bless, and everyone stay safe.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.